can't believe that I'm actually in Sharptown, New Jersey, at least through the uh, benefit of modern technology. I have heard so many good things about your church and have so often looked forward to coming for a visit. But thus far, the virus just hasn't allowed that to happen. I grew up in the Methodist church and became keenly aware of the way the denomination moves pastors around. And when I started my ministry, actually as a teenager, one of the first uh, jokes that I remember hearing was of the Methodist pastor in the community of Jamestown. And uh, conference time came around and he was told that he was going to be moved much to his chagrin. And conference came and sure enough, the uh, district superintendent announced that he had been transferred to another town away from Jamestown. The first Sunday he got at his new church, he listened to the congregation sing the congregational songs and said at the conclusion, that is the best congregational singing I think I've ever heard in my ministry outside of the congregational singing back at Jamestown. A little later, a soloist sang before the sermon and his comment when he got up to preach, I think that's one of the finest solos I've ever heard in my ministry, apart from solos that that I frequently heard at Jamestown. Well, when he got to the end of the service, he said to the people, you have to be one of the most attentive congregations that I've ever preached to outside of the congregation back at Jamestown. Well, a little old lady came to him as she walked out the door of the church and she said, Pastor, I hope very much that you would remember me this week in your prayers. And he was so flattered that she would ask for his prayers that he said to her, how, how might I pray for you? And she said, well, I'm getting older and it won't be long that I'll be dying. And when I die, if I don't make it to heaven, I just want to make it as far as Jamestown. Well, tomorrow, Wednesday, when I head back to Indiana, if for any reason I can't make it, maybe I could make it to Sharptown. We're glad you're here tonight and trust that uh, from the word that God will speak something new and fresh and yet challenging to your heart. I want to begin in just a moment reading from the book of Ephesians chapter five, a very familiar passage of scripture with which I'm sure most of you are well acquainted. Before we do that, let's just ask the Lord's blessing upon the reading of his word. Father, we thank you for your word, its relevance, its challenge to our lives on a daily basis. We pray your anointing upon both your messenger and the listener tonight, that things will be accomplished that will be of eternal value, and above all else, that your name will be given all the glory and praise. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Reading from Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The passage begins by saying, be careful then how you live. The word live in the NIV, actually in the King James, is translated walk. Be careful how you walk, or more literally, see then that you walk circumspectly. The reason I like the King James translation a little better is because it's a concept that the Apostle Paul embraced fairly consistently in the epistles 32 times. He uses that word each time in the King James translated walk. And in the book of Ephesians itself, he translates it eight times. Two of the times are negatively speaking. In chapter 2, verse 2, he warns us that we should not walk according to the course of this world. In chapter 4 and verse 17, he says, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the futility of their thinking. And then he begins a list of positive virtues in one's walk with the Lord. 
First of all, chapter 2, verse 10, walk in good works. Chapter 4, verse 1, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you have been called. Chapter 5 and verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us. Chapter 5, verse 8, walk as children of light. And then in verse 15, he says, walk circumspectly. Now, the adverb is used only once in all of the New Testament, and it means to look carefully how you walk, to walk with watchfulness in every way, according to uh, your alertness to be on guard against any surprise or in danger. I was always enamored by the Old Testament verse that all of us know pretty well by heart. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, there'll be times in the Christian life when we'll soar like eagles. There'll be other times that we'll be on the run to keep up with what all that God is doing. But on a daily basis, Christian life boils down to a day-by-day -day walk with our Lord. And Paul is alerting us with summons that we should be careful how we walk, that we walk circumspectly before the Lord in caution in the manner in which we bring glory to his name. Walking wise, not unwisely. The second admonition that he gives is that we should uh, make the most of every opportunity. Again, I prefer the King James, which says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Two things I want you to notice in that verse, that if we take the most of every opportunity, we are redeeming the time. The translations complement each other. Now, making the most of every opportunity, there's a beautiful study in the New Testament of the word opportunity, and I won't have time to let go over that tonight, but I challenge you to do it on your own on some other occasion. But making the best of every opportunity, we live life to its fullest because the opportunities that we're looking for are the opportunities that God in his grace gives to us on a daily basis. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of preaching in the Northeast of England in a beautiful little coastal town by the name of Berwick upon Tweed. I was a guest of a missionary Bible training college and the uh, headmaster of the school, his first name was David. Dr. David was a man that uh, made a great impact upon my life in the short time that I was exposed to him. And for this reason, he was not only the headmaster of the Bible training college, he was the only practicing physician within a 50 mile radius of his town. The whole community depended upon him for their medical care. And if that were not enough, he was the pastor of the local Baptist church. And the exciting thing about Dr. David, and particularly that I saw demonstrated when I was there for a visit and for ministry at the school, was that in spite of all of those responsibilities, he always had time for people. And when the day came for me to leave by train, I remember he came from the school to the house where I was staying, picked up my suitcases, and began to walk with me to the train station. And I said to him, David, you are such a busy man. Why didn't you send one of the students in your place? And he said, because I wanted the quality time with you and I wanted to spend it with my friend. And my next question was a very realistic one. How on earth do you do it? And his comment was, I'm disciplined. And I manage my time in such a way that I can do all of this without neglecting my family or the human relationships into which God places me. And he said the driving force, however, is that I believe that God called me into each of the three roles and day by day I'm fulfilling the will of God for my life. 
Now, you and I may not want to assume three special roles in our lives that demand the time and attention that Dr. David experienced. But there's a point here that Paul, I think, is trying to make, that in Christ, we want to live life to its fullest. And in doing so, we have to pay attention to our lifestyle and the way that we live. And when opportunities come that we know come from the Lord, we seize them in obedience to his will and do so expectantly to know that he's going to bless and do exceedingly abundantly more than we could even ask or think. Knowing that God is in control and guiding us brings a greater fullness to our life than anything else that we might know. But then the passage goes on to say, because the days are evil. Now, a parallel passage in the letter to the Colossians would say, because the time is short. Now, I don't think that I need to elaborate tonight on the difficult days in which you and I are living. I don't know of anything that capped it off more than just news that I heard this morning on uh, the local news. In one of the major cities of America, two deputy sheriffs were shot. They were rushed to the emergency room for care. They were met by protesters who were blocking the entryway into the emergency room. And they were doing it not only with their bodies, but with their voices shouting, we hope you die. Who would believe those kind of conditions would ever be forthcoming? in the land of America in which you and I are blessed to live. And we could elaborate on that over and over, but I wanna to go to that parallel passage because the time is short. If you begin to understand all of the dynamics that are going on in our world today, surely many of them are the fulfillment of prophecies outlined in the word of God that lead up to the day of the coming of Christ to rapture his church. The one television radio preacher that I really enjoy listening to is Dr. David Jeremiah. And he is a prophetic voice in our culture today. And he says repeatedly that everything that needs to happen before the coming of Christ has already happened and that the rapture of the church could occur on any day. And so the passage that I'm reading tonight to me speaks with a great deal of relevance for the day and age in which we live. The days are evil and the time is short and every believer should take note of their lifestyle and the quality of life that they're living, seizing every opportunity for the good of the kingdom and for the glory of the Lord. Now, the beauty of the passage is that Paul doesn't just give us those admonitions and not tell us some of the requirements to make it really happen. And they're twofold in this passage that want to be the focus of our attention both tonight and then again on Tuesday. He says in order to do that, we are to understand what the will of the Lord is. And secondly, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you tonight about understanding what the will of the Lord is. Tuesday night, we'll talk about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we uh, begin to talk about knowing the will of God, we uh, want to understand that this can be one of the most important dimensions of the life of a believer. Now, some of you are old enough to remember that way back in 1969, on the music scene came the voice of a young crooner by the name of Frank Sinatra. And in 69, he recorded what became his signature song by which he has been known in generations since. The song was simply entitled, My Way. Let me quote the words of the song to you in just the first verse and chorus. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I lived a life that's full. 
I've traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. I did it my way. Several years later, a Christian songwriter took the same song and rewrote it, exchanging only one word in the chorus. And it made all the difference in the world to the song. Let me read it with that word it changed. And so he says in the song, beginning in the first line of that song, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, and much more, much more than this, I did it God's way. You see the two versions of the song really elicit to us the choice that every one of us have to make in life. We either choose to live life our way or we choose to live it God's way. It was so important to Paul that when he wrote to the Colossian Christians, he wrote in chapter one, verse nine, for this very reason, since the day we heard of you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The will of God, such an important factor in our lives. In fact, I believe that some of the most important words you'll ever pray are the words that you find in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Words that should fall from the lips of our mouths with a great deal of sincerity. Now think with me a moment of two very obvious examples of that prayer. We begin not with Jesus, but his mother, Mary the Virgin. And when visited by the angel with the message of her conception of a child through a virgin birth, Mary's response has echoed through history, time upon end. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your will. Now we don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I have to believe that Mary had said a lot of smaller yeses earlier in her life leading up to this one big yes to the message of the angel. But not only maybe she said yes in other ways leading up, but we may stop sometimes to forget to uh, realize what it actually cost her to say yes to the angel. Let me just elicit some prices that she may indeed have paid as a responder to the message of the angel. She didn't know how Joseph would handle the news about uh, the virgin birth when she communicated it to him. She could have been stoned for her illegitimate pregnancy. Her life would be forever hounded by rumors and questions surrounding Jesus' birth. And she would have to be silent through most all of it, pondering everything in her heart trusting that the source of her shame would someday become the salvation of God's people. Now, what was costly for Mary can be costly to you and to me as well, but never as costly as it was to her son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. When he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed the prayer, O oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He did so at tremendous cost. Not only to die on the cross, but to suffer all of the things leading up to the breathing of his last breath before the cross brought him to ultimate death. But he did it because he was doing it within the will of his father. A number of years ago, I had some time on a Sunday afternoon. I was alone at home, 
And I went to my study, picked up the Bible, and decided that I wanted to read a while. And I thought the idea came to me that I would just pick a book and read it from beginning to end, uninterrupted, something that you don't get to do every day. And lo and behold, I felt led to very familiar scripture, the Gospel of John. And so I began to read, and I read till I read all 21 chapters of the Gospel. And then I laid the Bible aside. I took a piece of paper and pencil, and I wanted to just write down those memories of having read, things that spoke to me from that book in ways that maybe I had not been spoken to before. And I remember the first thing that came to my mind was when Jesus came to the well of Samaria, to the Samaritan woman at the well. And you know the story of how Jesus' uh, disciples came back with, with food for him to eat, and he rejected it. And they couldn't understand, and his answer was very simple. I have meat to eat that ye know not of, for my meat is to do the will of the Father that has sent me. And all of a sudden, it just struck me how, how beautiful it was. Here is a young man, age of 30, beginning his ministry, and he knows where he's going. He knows what his purpose for existence on earth really is. And so he's committed to the vision of fulfilling the will of the Father. And then all of a sudden, my, my mind jumps from those early chapters all the way to John chapter 17. Jesus is praying the high priestly prayer, and he says to his heavenly Father, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. And you know how it is sometimes when you're reading the word, and uh, that little voice whispers in the ear, I'm talking to you, are you listening? And I couldn't help but think of myself to where I would say it literally out loud, Lord, I want to run the race in that manner. I want to not only know now what you want me to do with my life as you make clear to me day by day, but I want to be able to come to the end of the life and look back and say, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. I was reading recently in the first epistle of Peter. Peter says in the fourth chapter, verses two through four, makes this statement. As a result, the person who is done with sin does not live the rest of his earthly life for human evil desires, but rather for the will of God. Now, I'm a bit of a fan of the, the message, and I love the way that it is paraphrased in the message. Let me read it to you. Think of your sufferings as weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. Now there again, the choice proposes itself. We can live according to our will or we live according to the will of God. And one thing almost all Bible scholars and theologians agree upon that believe in the word of God as inspired is that all, that all of us, even after we are converted, have remaining in us a nature that still has its root in a sinful, driven desire for life to have things our way and not God's way. And that's where I think we come to the issue of living a holy life. We come to the place that we confront that in our life, not as something that we're going to have to struggle with the rest of our days, not something that uh, we're gonna to have to deny even exists, but it's something that Christ died to provide for us a remedy. And to me, anything less is an anemic provision of salvation from God. I believe that he provides for us a way that we can become overcomers uh, in that area of our commitment and our daily walk with the Lord. Now, let me quote a couple of guys who wrote a book by the entitled uh, Holy is a Four Letter Word. Two quotes, one found on, verse, on page 44. It says this, 
Although the living of a holy lifestyle is a progressive journey, as it were, it begins in Gethsemane, a place where a Christ follower prays the prayer of Jesus, and to do the best of his ability and knowledge, surrenders his will to the will of his heavenly Father. And if you turn the page, you get an additional quote that I think is relevant. I believe that a day must come in our lives as definite as the day of our conversion when we give all of ourselves to the Lord and submit totally to his lordship in our lives, surrendering ourselves, our loved ones, our possessions, our present, our future, all of our life. It's the day we surrender control of our lives to him and we begin to enjoy the freedom, the real freedom that is ours in Christ. Over the years of my walk with the Lord, which now has been almost 65 years of walking with Christ, I've said frequently that God has spoken to me more in my walk with the Lord through music than through any other tool other than the Word of God. I'm just amazed at how often a thought from a song that I hear sung will fix itself in my mind and challenge me and motivate me, sometimes encourage me, sometimes convict me. But I listen attentively for those messages of the Lord through song. Now, I, uh, I like classical music. I like semi-classical music. I love the old hymns of the church. I like contemporary music that is both singable and substantive in its message. But in some ways, it's the old hymns that speak loudest to me. And sometimes the gospel songs, such as those written by the blind songwriter, Fanny Crosby. And I love to sing with zest the song, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. And it gave thy spoke thy love to me. But there's a verse in that song that God uses to speak to my heart as well. The words go like this, consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and here it is, and my will be lost in thine. There is no greater life than to live in the center of the will of God and to understand the implications of all that that means. Now, technically, it all boils down to basically two very important issues that revolve around the Lordship of Christ. Number one, it infers an unwavering trust in God. We're never going to surrender ourselves to someone that we can't trust. But when we know we can trust someone beyond measure, it makes it a lot easier to make that act of surrender and to place ourselves under his control. I love um, the passage that's found in the Gospel of Luke when we hear the story of the prodigal returning to uh, the father. But the, um, the chapter before it in chapter 14, in which uh, the Lord says, if any man will not take up his cross, deny himself and follow me, he's really not worthy to be my disciple. And when I have read that, it's spoken to me in three ways. First of all, it is important for me that I surrender to the Lord all of my earthly possessions. I don't own anything. Everything that I manage in my life of a material, material nature uh, has another owner. It belongs to the Lord. And he's been so good to bless my wife and me as we have sought to honor him. But I recognize the tremendous responsibility of allowing him to manage the material blessings of my life. I don't think anyone uh, illustrated that more beautifully than Job. And when Job was reduced in one day from probably a multimillionaire to a pauper, the only response that Job could give was, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A number of years ago, I was in uh, the North Island of, of uh, New Zealand, and I was speaking at a missions conference, 
And I remember that I spoke on the Lordship of Christ and, and really giving everything that we have to the Lord and placing it under his Lordship. And that night I gave an invitation and I think somewhat to my surprise, there were nine adults that came and stood for a closing prayer uh, at the invitation to come and give everything they had to the Lord and to place it under his Lordship. And we had a great prayer and the presence of the Lord was so real on that occasion. I remember that in the following days, I made my way back to the States and I hadn't been back a little over a month until I got a letter from one of the nine people that had answered that invitation. It was a lady that had come to the North Island from the South Island to attend the missions conference at which I was speaking. And this was her story and I, I found it quite novel and yet quite relevant. She said, when I went back to my hotel the night after hearing you speak, there was a message on my phone telling me to call home to the South Island immediately, that it was urgent. I got on the phone, dialed the number. The operator said, I can't put you through unless you're calling family and it is an immediate emergency. And she said it is on both accounts. And so she said, my husband answered the phone and he said to me, honey, sit down. I have some bad news. And she said, um, the way I feel right now, I could take any news standing up, what's happened? And he said, uh, we've had an earthquake here on the South Island, not uncommon for the South Island of New Zealand. And he said, every piece of your furniture in our home is destroyed. Now she said, let me explain that to you. She said, we raised a pretty good sized family and we never had decent furniture. Any that we bought, the kids tore up or over time wore out. And she said, the day came when the nest was empty. And my husband looked over to me and said, you've been such a good mother to our children. I wanna reward you and you can completely furnish the house from one room to the next with total new furniture. And she said, I did. And I did it with great pride and with great thankfulness. She said a weird thing happened. It hadn't been a few weeks after getting all of our new furniture that the grandkids came over. And after they'd been there for a little while, one of my grandchildren looked at me and said to me, Grandma, what's happened to you? You're not the kind grandma you used to be before you got all that new furniture. And she said, all of a sudden, I realized that something is immaterialist furniture that could always be replaced had become so much a part of my pride that I had become a bully to my grandkids and they didn't even like to be around me. And so when my husband told me it had all been destroyed, he, she said, I remember just simply saying to him, well, praise the Lord. And she said, after he got up off the floor and put a smiley face, she, he said, what did you say? And I explained, and he, she said, I said to him, as of this evening, that furniture wasn't mine in the beginning. It all belonged to the Lord. Many people in our society get so caught up in the material that it becomes such a source of pride that that old nature squeezes out the trust that God would have us put in him to know that he will give and that he will take away only in our best interest and to give us the fullest life that we could possibly live. Everything that we have needs to be put under his lordship. But then secondly, I believe that passage says that we've got to put under the lordship of Christ all of our objects of affections. Now this is where it gets harder for me my wife and I are blessed to have two daughters. We have two son-in-laws and now we have four grandchildren. We have two grandsons in Indiana and two grandchildren, a grandson and granddaughter in California. And I have done funerals for people who believing they were going to die long before their children did, who stood at the casket looking in the face of their child, 
it was taken from them at an early age. And as I look in the eyes of my grandchildren, even to this day, I can't fathom what it would be like to stand by one of their caskets and to look down on them, believing that I'll go along before they'll ever even think about dying. And I realize how much that even my grandchildren don't belong to me. You know, my grandson that's 17, he's making important decisions in his life right now. I'd really like to help him. You know, I've been over the road. I've learned a few things along the way, and I'm sure in my wisdom, I would guide him correctly. But his life isn't mine to direct, only the Lord's. And I can only say to him, Kyle, when you make that decision, are you confident that's what God wants you to do? My wife has um, always reminded me so vividly that we have a daughter that lives in California, and that's a long way from Indiana. We don't get to see her as often as we'd like. We don't get to see the grandchildren as often as we'd like. We really wish they'd move back to Indiana. But Vicki's word has always been, I would rather see our daughters halfway around the world in the will of God than to have them living next door outside the will of God. The objects of our affections don't even belong to us. And remember that even Job not only lost his material possession, he lost his children, and still he could bless the Lord. Jesus was Lord over his family. And then lastly, I believe the passage says that we yield our life, our future, all that God has in store for us to his will, not ours. God called me to preach when I was 15 on a Palm Sunday evening. And I'd grown up in the church and uh, I was the object of one of those little boys that grew up that got patted on the head by the parishioners saying, someday little Charles is going to grow up and be a preacher. And I really got to where I resented that. It just seemed to separate me from all of my peers and I wasn't ready to be separated. And I really got to the place that I could say to the Lord, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do with my life. I just won't be a preacher. You'd have thought I would have learned then that you'd never say no to the Lord. Back in 1977, Vicki and I were called of God to plant a church in the town that we live now. And when we said yes to the call to do so, we made it very clear that we would help get the church started, but we would not stay to be the permanent pastor. We had other plans. 28 years later, I retired from being the permanent pastor of that church. My life, even at approaching 80, the days that the Lord will spare my life until he calls me home, they don't even belong to me. And people sometimes ask me why I don't quit. I've preached long enough. I've, I've paid my dues. Well, I'll quit when the Lord tells me to. But until that day happens, I want to stay in the will of the Lord even if it means dying with my boots on, I will die happy. And so you see, the will is a, is a big issue in our life. It's an important thing, and we only yield when we have an unwavering trust in God. And the one thing that I can say of a certain to you or anyone that would ask, in almost 80 years of my life, my Lord has never failed me yet. And I don't intend him ever to in the days yet ahead. Our God is a God who can be trusted. The second thing that is important is a willingness to accept his will regardless of the circumstances. In some ways, why would God even bother to reveal his will to us if he knows in advance we're not going to accept? Now, he may anyway. But I, uh, I've always likened my life to walking somewhat in the dark with a flashlight. Do you ever think about walking in the dark with a flashlight? A flashlight won't give you enough vision to see the end from the beginning. But every step that you take, you get one step further down the road. But as you take that step, the light advances to show you the next step that you are to take. 
that Christian life is indeed a walk. And through the epidemic, the quarantines that my wife and I have experienced, we've learned new and afresh that you don't plan what you're going to do next week. You just live it a day at a time. And you trust the Lord in your unwavering trust that he is going to make his will plain and be trusted as you live it a day at a time. Does that day come in your life? Do you know the freedom whereof I speak tonight of just knowing that it's all in his care and that he will only, I get up every morning thinking to myself, there is nothing that this day holds for me but what my God and I together can face for my good and for his eternal glory. That is the glue that holds my life together. I hope it's yours. And I believe that that day will come if we find that liberty that I was in Christ, if we ever live victoriously a holy life in an unholy world, when we are going to walk through our own Gethsemane, ultimately to Calvary, to say with the Apostle Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet it's not I anymore. It's Christ that lives in and through me. But the beauty of the walk is that when we go from Gethsemane to Calvary, the next step is to the garden tomb, and the tomb is empty. And there is our victory when we allow the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life and the submission of our will to the will of the Father to allow the fullness of his spirit to indwell within us, working out its way every day that we live. I challenge you with those thoughts tonight, and I pray that you're there in your decision and commitment to the Lord Jesus. I close with this quote found from C.S. Lewis in his book, The Great Divorce. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done. Let me read it one more time. Think about it. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Will you pray with me? With your head bowed and your eye closed, wherever you are at the church, comfort of your living room, or maybe sitting at the kitchen table. You say, Lord, what have I heard tonight that you want me to pay most attention to? What steps do I need to take to allow that word to become flesh? and dwell in me. And if there are areas of your life that you've never really surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, perhaps you'd want to do that even now. And say, Lord, my possessions, they all belong to you. I claim your Lordship over them. The objects of my affection, my family, the best of friends that I possess, I yield them over to you that you'll guide their lives and lead them into the path of abundance. And Father, the days that remain in my lifetime upon earth, whether young or old, I yield completely to you, longing to be day by day living in the center of your will. And I believe that it would mean a great deal if you, having prayed that prayer, could just Tell someone close to you, maybe even go to your pastor and just say to him, you know, as a result of, of that session that I listened to the other evening, as never before, I know that Christ is not only my Savior, he's my Lord, Lord over all that I am and all that I possess. We yield it to you and we do it in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. See you tomorrow night. Same time.
same station. <laughs>